Hi guys, welcome to chapter 2, Sexology and Research. So this is not a super long chapter, so we'll try to get through this fast. Um, but it is an important and an interesting chapter. Um, sex research is, I mean, we can do all sorts of psychology based on our, our ideas, our philosophy, and that's really how we've done psychology for over a century now. And before psychology was an official field, we had philosophy, which is just our ideas. Problem with not basing something like psychology on research is that our ideas are often wrong. Sometimes common sense is wrong. Okay? It seems like it should be right, makes sense, sounds right, isn't right. For instance, couples therapists for years have believed that I statements and you statements are helpful for a relationship. And that is, instead of saying like, you threw your socks on the ground instead of putting them in the laundry basket and that makes me really mad. You say, I feel mad when you throw your socks on the ground instead of put them, putting them in the laundry basket. However, research shows that doesn't help at all. Um, and if you wanna know what does help with couples and relationships, we'll get to that in the love and communication chapter. Um, but research has shown us things that actually help marriages stay together and actually are what makes marriages fall apart. Even though something like I statements and you statements, that sounds logical, sounds like it should be helpful to say I am angry instead of you piss me off, um, but that's actually not helpful. All right, anyhow, so sex and research. The goals of sex research understand sexual behavior. We, we need to know what's happening before we can do anything about it. Then predict sexual behavior. What happens if you raise a child this way? What happens if you raise a child in a sexually repressive home? What happens if a child gets molested? What happens if a woman is raped? What happens to future sexuality, sexuality future marriage, relationship issues, and so on? It, it's helpful to predict what's going to happen in the future. Then, of course, we want to change things. We want to make our sex better. We want to have better relationships. We want to influence things. So a sex therapist needs to base any sort of intervention they do on research that is out there. Um, so that's the ultimate goal of sex research. Um, and then, of course, we also have to take into consideration ethics when we are doing research. So you couldn't... Um, you know, traumatize a child just to see what happens when they grow up. That would obviously be unethical as well as illegal. Uh, however, research has been done like that in the past where we've, uh, the little Albert experiment, you should have read about that in Psych 101. So they gave a kid a phobia just to prove that emotions are learned and not inborn. Um, and obviously that is not ethical, right? So there are a lot of ethical issues in sex research. There's also a lot of bias issues and that's important to consider as well. If you think of who volunteers for sex studies, so for instance, one study they did where they, um, they wanted a couple to come in and have sex inside of an MRI machine so they could see what the penis was physically doing. And interestingly, the penis kind of bows like a boomerang inside the woman's body. Um, just random fact there. By the way, here's another random fact. Do you know that somebody who um, remembers a lot of trivia is called a spermologist? I have no idea why. There's a fly that keeps landing on me, driving me crazy. All right, so lots of random facts in today's lecture. I didn't get enough sleep last night. All right, so who's gonna volunteer for that study? Obviously, it's going to be somebody in a relationship. So is the penis different in somebody who hasn't ever had sex? You know, you don't know those sorts of things. If you wanted to um, study masturbation practices, who's going to volunteer for a study where you have to talk about masturbation? Obviously people who are more comfortable and open about sex. So the people who tend to volunteer for sex research studies tend to be much more sexually open. They tend to be more exhibitionist in personality, meaning they, they're more like show-offy. Um, they, they tend to be liberal politically. They tend to be more positive towards homosexuality and um, more pro-choice. So those are, unsurprisingly, those are characteristics of people in sex research study. The problem is you can't generalize to, you know, a 
a virgin living in a cult somewhere in a super religiously oppressive environment, right? What you learn from this, you know, West Hollywood liberal, um, not to make fun of them, but you know, it's, what you learn from that person may not apply to the other person in the very different situation. So you have to keep that in mind when you are reading any sex research study. Who are they sampling? What is the population? What are the characteristics of that population? And how well does it generalize to other populations? All right, so we have two types of studies, experimental and non-experimental. Um, non-experimental is why my mother, who is a biologist, or actually a physiologist, calls psychology a soft science. Because you can't do pure experimental research in psychology most of the time. Um, because it's unethical. So, uh, like I said about traumatizing the child, you know, if you wanted to see what were the effects of uh, heroin long term if a fetus is exposed to heroin, you can't shoot a mom up with heroin in order to see what happens to the baby. That's unethical. But that is pure experimental science. You, you take something, you manipulate it, and then you see what happens. And you just can't do that most of the time in psychology, hence it being a soft science. Um, so you have to do non-experimental studies. However, that does not mean that they're not good, legitimate studies. You can find babies who happen to be exposed to heroin in utero, and then you can follow them through their life and you can see what happened to them. That is still good research, okay? So experimental is held up as the gold standard, but it's not always possible. It's also not always possible in other science communities besides psychology. Um, but the majority of research in the field of psychology is non-experimental. Now, it's still an experiment, but it's not classified as an experimental experiment. So it's not pure science, it's soft science. Okay. My mom wins that argument. All right, so different research methods. I'm not going to go through all of this um, at the moment, but you've got case studies, surveys, direct observation, and then pure experimental methods, which I basically just talked about. All right, so let's talk about case studies first. So a case study, you are following a single individual in order, or sometimes a small group, in order to see what happens to that one person. The great thing about case studies is you get the super detailed information about that one person. Um, and you may not be able to get that much detail about lots of people because maybe it's just that one person. You know, um, what, what's the psychological characteristics of a eunuch? Um, that's some, a man who has been castrated as a child, so his testicles were cut off. That used to be a fairly common practice in many cultures. Um, what is their psychology like? Are they able to have a relationship with a woman? So there's not a lot of eunuchs in the world nowadays. So if you found somebody who was a eunuch, um, you might want to just research that one person's life and then publish a study about it so other people would know. So that would be a case study. You're following one individual. You might also look at, you know, what, what's sexuality like in a cult? So a cult is a very small group, usually unless it's like Scientology and then there's a lot of people in it. Um, but it's, it's a small group, and so that would be a small case study, about one small part of the population. So you get a lot of detailed information, it's very in-depth about this one person or one group, um, and it does not generalize to the entire population. But we don't always need to do that. Sometimes we just need information on this one unique person or experience, because um, somebody else might go through that. So anyhow, how we do case studies, we can directly observe, you just watch, you can give questionnaires, you can do tests, and you can do experiments. Okay, so a case study can be experimental, it can be non-experimental, it just depends on how it's set up. Then we can just do surveys. Okay, now notice case studies also had surveys, a questionnaire is a survey. So a lot of times you can mix and match and do multiple methods in a, um, in a bit of research. All right, so a survey, you're just asking the participants about something in their life, their sexual experience, how often they masturbate, what's their relationship like. You could ask what their IQ is in relationship to their sexual activity. Um, and these are surveys that have been done. We have asked people their IQ and then asked how often they have sex outside of marriage or how often they masturbate or whatever. Um, the higher your education, the uh, more sexual satisfaction you have, which is interesting. The higher your education, the less likely you are to get a divorce. 
Um, so good for you for being in college because you'll be less likely to have a screwed up life. Um, although it's not guaranteed, right? Correlation thing. Okay, so surveys are good for any number of populations, small to large. One of the downsides to large is it could be expensive to do a survey, especially if you have to do face-to-face -face interviews um, or print out a whole bunch of paperwork. Nowadays with the internet, we do a lot of surveys online, so it doesn't really cost anything. So um, there's a lot of variety with surveys. Some of the problems are that people are not always honest. So if I ask you, how often do you masturbate? I don't know why I keep asking, saying stuff about that, but anyhow. Um, if I ask you how often that happens, you may not be willing to answer me, or maybe not answer me honestly. And what we found, it's called um, response bias. So people respond according to what they believe is expected of them. So what, what would you say to me that you believe I would think well of you, that I would have a positive response. So if you think that I'm negative towards masturbation, you would say, oh, I never do, or maybe seldom, or something like that. Um, but if you think I'm really like pro uh, single sex, then you might over exaggerate how often. And this is often what happens with when we ask how many sex partners have you had. Women will minimize it because you should be a virgin, you know, the Madonna whore thing. <laughs> and men will often over exaggerate um, because they believe there's an expectation. And there is kind of an expectation in society that men should be more experienced than women. Okay, so that's a response bias. And we often get that problem in surveys, although you can get that problem in basically any type of research. Direct observation, you'll get less of that because people are going about their daily life often, depending on how the, the study's set up. And so it's hard to lie when you're just living life. Um, however, with a direct observation, you can have natural or lab-based direct observation. So you can bring people into a lab, like John Gottman did with studying relationships. He brought a couple in and said, have an argument. So he could study how you argue and how successful your marriage is. We'll get more into that later. Um, so that's a lab observation versus if he watched them in their home. Um, and he did try to set that up. Like he had an apartment that a couple would stay the weekend and there was cameras so that he could watch arguments in a natural setting. So he did both natural direct observation as well as lab-based direct observation. All right, anyhow, back to surveys. Um, another problem is often we're not honest on surveys because we just don't realize the truth. Maybe you don't know how many times a month on average you have sex uh, because you don't count that usually. And, or uh, maybe they ask, uh, how, how close to ovulation do you have sex? Um, and who tracks that, right? Who remembers that? So sometimes the questions are worded poorly um, and sometimes it's hard to remember the answers. And so a poorly worded questionnaire or survey can just can get really bad results. Also, who you choose to sample. I talked about this a little bit with a sampling bias. Um, and like most, most of the time we get um, more liberal, sexually open-minded people in a sex study. So again, choosing the sample is important. You need a representative sample. So this is a small group of people that represents the larger population. That is if you want the study to generalize to the larger population. If you're doing a case study, you may not care about that. Okay. Um, but probably the majority of studies would want a representative sample. They would want it to represent the larger population. Now it also depends on what you want it to generalize to. Do you want it to generalize to the whole world or do you want it to generalize to African American men? Okay, so what is your goal in doing this uh, research? Who do you, who is the larger target population that you are trying to represent? Because if you're only trying to represent African American men, then why would you have Mexicans or white people or women in the study, right? You, you shouldn't waste your money and time studying those people. And if they are in the sample, then you can't say for sure that it generalizes to African American men. Okay? So that's a representative sample. And then many studies will want a random sample. So you don't want to choose like your closest friends to be in the study because that is less likely to represent the population that you're trying to represent. So some studies will um, we used to have the yellow pages, right? So everybody's phone number was listed and you just go through and randomly 
pick, you know, a hundred people and, and get them to be in the study. So it was a random sample um, that hopefully accurately represented the largest, the larger uh, population. All right, uh, I talked about direct observation. Did we talk about this earlier? Oh, case studies. Okay. So sometimes a case study has direct observation, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it has surveys, sometimes it doesn't. Okay, so direct observation, you watch people. I feel like I've already talked about all of this, so I'll go through it quickly. So all you're doing is you're observing. You're either observing in the natural setting or you're observing in the lab setting. Um, a natural setting, you're more likely to have people behave naturally. On the, the disadvantage of that is that um, there's a lot of other variables that can impact a natural observation. So if you want to see how two kids interact and you watch them on the playground, the problem is there's a hundred other kids who could be messing up your study. You put them in a lab and you know you just have those two kids. It's controlled. However, it's also less natural. So um, advantages, disadvantages. It works better with small to moderate samples. Obviously, it's hard to directly observe a million people. Okay? Um, it, it does not eliminate the possibility of falsification. Okay? I know the book says that. It does not eliminate the possibility. The possibility is still there especially in the lab setting. Um, I need to change this PowerPoint. I know the book says that, but uh, people can lie when they're being observed unless they don't know they're being observed. Okay, So as soon as the researcher enters the natural setting, it is not natural anymore. If you are standing on a playground watching kids, those kids know you're there and they, it may change their behavior. Okay, or they may know that you have certain expectations of them, and so they may change according to whatever their perception is of, of your expectations. Okay, so people can lie under direct observation. It's totally possible. Um, records can be kept indefinitely. Yeah, of course, records can be kept indefinitely for all these studies. I guess I need to change this PowerPoint. Um, oh, and then I said this already. Behavior can be influenced by observers. Okay. Um, all right. So how about we talk about some sexology technology. So we can, we, we can and we have done these weird and amazing studies where we, um, we measure the arousal levels with electronic devices. So these are some of our sex tech. So um, this one is, these are vaginal and rectal myographs. So they, um, they record like pressure changes and usually temperature changes and so on um, in the vaginal muscles and the rectal muscles. Um, accord and so that can tell you how aroused you are. Um, this one down here measures t usually temperature and humidity. Okay, And then this noose we put around the penis is called a penile strain gauge. And it is measuring the strain that the um, metal is under as the penis enlarges. Okay, so it can measure how much blood flow to the penis, how much of an erection the man is having based on um, his arousal. Okay, um, so <clears throat> one of the problems with sex technology is it's based on the idea that of arousal concordance, that your arousal levels match what's going on in your brain, or your, your physical arousal levels match your emotional arousal levels. And this is generally true with men. It is not always true with women. As a matter of fact, most of the time it isn't true with women. It's called arousal non-concordance. I mentioned this in chapter one, and I'll talk about it more in, um, I think, the next chapter. But women in particular can become physically aroused without becoming emotionally aroused, and they can become emotionally aroused without did I say that right? And they, <laughs> anyhow, it's opposites, right? Your physical and your emotional arousal does not match, okay, as a woman. Um, as a matter of fact, research has shown that it only matches like around 10% of the time for women, and for men, it's around 50% of the time. So men can also have arousal non-concordance. Um, so yeah, I'll talk more about that later. It's really fascinating. Um, for instance, they have found, I believe they used um, this one. And I say this one because pronouncing that's really hard. Photoplevismograph, I believe it's called. I always, I have the hardest time with that one. Photoplevismograph. Um, so uh, with that one, they measured that women actually 
become physically aroused with the sound of exotic cars, which does not surprise me, to be honest, but um, the sound of like a Lamborghini revving. causes physical arousal in women. Alright, so the last slide, and this is the one thing I want you to absolutely get from this chapter, even though I haven't talked about it, I still want you to get it. Um, and you should already have had this from Psych 101. If you took Psych 101 with me and you don't remember this, shame on you. Um, and if you did not learn this in your Psych 101 class from another teacher, shame on the teacher, because this is the most important thing you should take away from psychology, period. Correlation is not causation. Do you remember what correlation is? That is when one thing is associated with another. So um, sun exposure is associated with sunburn, especially if you have my color skin. Okay, so the, a positive correlation is the more time you spend in the sun, the more sunburn you get. Positive correlation, one thing increases, the other increases. A negative correlation is as one thing increases, the other decreases. So, um, as money spending increases, uh, your checking account balance decreases. So that is a negative correlation. Some correlations are stronger than others. So for instance, um, happiness and genetics is about a 0.5 or so correlation. So that's moderately strong. Um, zero is no correlation at all. One is a perfect correlation. Um, so correlation is not causation. What this means is just because two things are associated does not mean that they're causing each other. So sun exposure and sunburn, that's correlational and I, would say it's also causational, right? So the sun exposure is ca directly causing the sunburn. Um, however, if, and if you took my class, you've heard this example because it's always my favorite example. This is true. Um, ice cream intake is positively correlated with drowning. So the more ice cream you eat, the more likely you are to drown. Now, does ice cream eating cause drowning? No, of course not. But what it happens is there's a third variable, and that is the heat. The hotter it is, the more likely you are to eat ice cream. The hotter it is, the more likely you are to go swimming and drown. So even though they're correlated, they're positively correlated, they're not causing each other. It's not causational. So you have to be really careful when you read research or hear about research, and it said scientists found that um, the more vegetables you eat, the worse your sex life is. Okay, that does not necessarily mean that vegetables are causing sex life. Uh, are, that does not mean that vegetable eating is causing a worse sex life, which would be a negative correlation, right? They're just correlated, they're not necessarily causational. It could be that a bad sex life makes you want more vegetables, or it could be that there's a third variable entirely that is causing both and they have nothing to do with each other, okay? Um, so just remember that just because two things are associated, they're not causing each other, okay? So correlation is not causational. Um, and also remember, you have experimental and non-experimental research. That's another important factor to remember. Um, but non-experimental research is still valid science. So tell my mom that psychology is not a soft science, all right? Okay, see you in the next chapter.